Welcome to TC Tiawi Talks, Tia Chucha Centro Cultural located on Tataviam land in the Northeast San Fernando Valley is rooted in ancestral knowledge, culture, the arts, literacy, and social justice as a means to personal and communal transformation. It is a place where hearts and minds have united for change for over 19 years. Join us as we share the stories of personal transformation and our understanding of the world that unites us as a community. We must remember that another world has always been possible. Tiawi, a Nahuatl word for adelante, to move forward. Like a spiral, together we move towards a better future, cognizant of the resiliency we carry from our past. All right. Well, welcome to an episode of Tia We Talk Special Edition with Trauma to Transformation Project People. Um, my name is Rebecca. I coordinate the project with other folks, um, but I'm also here to uh, facilitate a conversation with special guests. I'm very excited to see it, all three of you. Um, so if you can introduce yourselves, um, that would be great just so we can start. So I could start. Uh, my name is Luis Rodriguez. I am a co-founder of Tia Chucha Centro Cultural. And I've been um, an author, many books, 16. The latest is From Our Land to Our Land. Um, my name is um, Ramiro Rodriguez, the son of Luis J. Rodriguez. Um, I'm from Chicago. Uh, doing a lot of community work, mentoring work. Uh, have a, a lot of experience when it comes to some trauma and transformation. And my name is Kisasi Hill. I'm the adopted son of Luis Rodriguez. <laughs> 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 uh, and, you know, creative writing facilitator for the Trauma to Transformation Program and youth mentor. Uh, also, Arthur uh, for the book of creative, um, of uh, compiled poetry. Uh, Serengeti noise. Mm. You can get a copy at the Achuchas bookstore. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, can somebody maybe start with what is trauma the transformation? Um, Let me go ahead and start because I know the, uh, the other ones have some very clear ideas on this, but the idea actually came to me. Um, as people know, I was a very troubled young man for if you read my memoir, Always Running. But I was very fortunate in that I had help from the activists of the movimiento, the Chicano movement of the time, who uh, got me uh, out of the gangs, got me out of the drugs, got me into social justice struggles. So I, uh, even though I'm formerly incarcerated, I never did state time that these other young men will tell you about, but I never forgot any of my homies. I never forgot all the guys that were getting busted and doing 20, 30, 40 years, you know, and so many of them. Um, so when I was 25, I went back to prisons but I came back to teach creative writing. My me mentor, and I have to mention him, is Manasar Gamboa. Ramiro knows him. He was my mentor teacher. He did 17 years, was a 20-year heroin addict, and quit everything. He changed his life to go into the prison juvenile halls. He's actually well-known and famous. There's a mural of him in Long Beach for the center that he used to work for. Um, and he passed away in the year 2000. But he was the one that got me in and helped me understand how to negotiate myself to the prison system. So uh, believe it or not, I've been going to prisons for 40 years, uh, doing creative writing classes and mostly one-time poetry readings or lectures. And I'd done healing circles. Romito came with me to San Quentin to do two or three healing circles over there. So, the, and I'm doing it not just in this state, but like 20 states. I've done it in Mexico, Central America, um, South America, and in Europe. Uh, because of my reputation, they brought me into these prisons. The one thing I would say about trauma transformation, what I feel the underlying idea is even with all the trauma that people go through, and I know people go through some hard stuff. I'm not even in some really hard stuff. There is actually within everyone the capacity to change. That's an important idea because society says people can't change. You know what I'm saying? And I know it isn't easy to change. I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm, I get some guys aren't going to change. You know what I'm saying? But it's there. If you work with people in a certain way, provide them resources, tools, connections, the proper relationships, all these things, people can go from trauma to transformation. I believe it's true individually, but I also believe it's true in society. 
So that's basically the idea behind it. Um, I guess I'll go next. <laughs> well, trauma to transformation, you know, uh, though started by Louise, it was perfectly, perfectly shaped, you know, for my life reality, because I started off in, you know, as in the streets, gang banger, you know, from Pacoima, California, and I was arrested at 16. So from the age of 16 years old, I'm talking about literally three days after my 16th birthday. So my life or world experience was from a 15 year old's perspective. So going through prison, I started off in the juvenile halls and went from the juvenile halls to the county jails, from the county jail gang module uh, to the youth authorities, from the youth authorities to the prisons, you know, so every aspect of institutionalization that there is criminal or judicial institutionalization that there is, I, I touched it and um, was raised in it. And I didn't get out until I was 43 years old. So from 15 year old world perspective to a 43 year old man getting out, the importance of, you know, transforming trauma was essential, you know, so being in there, you can never imagine what a person goes through in prison, you know, and what prison, uh, the kind of effect that it has on the psyche, the kind of effect that it can have physically, emotionally. So when you get out, we have to have a place to put this stuff. So for me, the art of uh, poetry was a haven for me. It was a source for me to be able to express or to deal with a lot of the traumas that you know, I was, uh, that I caused and a lot of the traumas that uh, I was afflicted upon me. So uh, it was a perfect vehicle for me. So to be able to get out and to teach people or at least be able to try to help them uh, find a path of healing is a healing in itself. So for, you can't just undo, you know, 20 something years of incarceration or 20 something years of trauma in a matter of, days or years or even a decade. It takes a, a, a continuous effort, always something, you know, uh, uh, active to do to bring about that healing. So for me to be able to teach creative writing and to assist people, you know, in their traumas in hopes of transformation is a healing for me itself. Um. <clears throat> So for me, um, my experiences come from Chicago. Um, that's when I, that's where I did my prison time in the Illinois prison system. So, but uh, there's there's a lot there's some differences, but then there's also a lot of things that are just the same as in California. There are a lot of young people and who are incarcerated from the different neighborhoods who have to learn how to get along with each other, even though they've been fighting with each other for decades, generations going down. The families, you know, and so it's hard for people to try to get along. It's hard for people to try to, you know, forget about all the trauma that's been placed in their lives, you know, and from these neighborhoods. And then you put them into a, a, a place where they all have to try to come together, supposedly, and, and a lot of times it doesn't work. And then that's where a lot of the trauma comes from, especially. And then the guard, you know, we know the correctional officers instigate a lot of those, those issues that, you know, that we've got, we have to deal with on our own and then they just bring more into it, you know? So I always felt like, you know, when guys come out of prison or, or even women or even young young people, um, the there's always the first things that they're always trying to you know, look for, right? Housing, job, things that they're going to, you know, that, that's their survival. It's needed, of course, you know, right? But, it's a, but, it's, but what about the long haul? What about your, your spiritual component, your, your, your mental capacity, your, your emotional well-being? What about all those things that are going to keep you surviving? You know, it's great if you have a job, but if you, know, if you continue to keep drinking or if you continue to keep going down a path, then you're going to end up losing that job and might end up back in prison. So that's why I feel like what the trauma the transformation gives to people, you know, gives them that, that, that hope. That, um, that they'll be able to survive in the in the long run, you know. Yes, jobs are important, housing is important, food. We they, they need all of that. I'm not going to take that away, but I I really uh, appreciate everybody that's a part of the common transformation and what they give to them. You know, helping people to tap into their imagination, their potentials, like my dad was saying. Um, 
and then even you know great teachers like Kasasi, the creative writing that that, that he's able to to um, help with all these people, you know, and then, and then Rebecca just all the logistics, and you know, what, she's a writer in herself. I've heard some of this stuff, <laughs> you know. So these are things that are important, and these are the things that we hope that uh, all of these people that have come out in, in and out of the prison system, so they can come to PFC, they can be a part of the trauma transformation, they can see that we're really trying to, uh, you know, help them um, not just go back to prison, but how, I mean, I'm, I'm helping to keep them from going back to prison, but help them live a life that they felt that they were living. Because that's the issue. The way the society uh, treats us, that we're not, we're worthless, that we don't have the values, that we're not, you know, we don't mean anything that we're not supposed to be a part of the society in the only place that we belong is back in prison. And that's how they try to treat us. And we want to give them something different, you know, and, and, and we do, especially through, through, through the native components. You know, we're indigenous, you know, we do ceremonies, but also through, through, through the writing, the poetry. And then we have artists. And, you know, in prison, there's a lot of revolutionaries, artists, poets, <laughs> you know, and so we want to tap into those energies because that's important. And that's just for for them, but also for society, you know, there's a lot of things that are happening in this world right now that th it's not working. So how come, why not try this, maybe, you know, maybe the prison, people are coming out of prison, you never know. So there's a lot of things that we can still do and I'm, and I'm looking forward to see, you know, what happens next. Quetzalcoatl enters my body and the words become the wind, a self-reflection of a boy fighting to become a man. We have created our own self-loathing. The words reverberate through every spirit. Quetzalcoatl resurrects our hearts. The blackness disappears. For one brief moment, we are shining stars, gods. Pain becomes self-love and the men withdraw. My poem becomes a shield against who we don't want to be. My poem becomes a blanket that comforts the boy and in his dreams, a man emerges for one brief moment. We all are Quetzalcoatl. Um, on that note, I um, hear uh, that, you know, there's different groups out there. And um, for trauma transformation, I feel it's, diff it's unique because of that aspect of uh, the spirit and the arts. So I was wondering if y'all um, could describe that a little bit more. Uh, why is it important? Why is it important for it to be a theatricha program and that aspect of the arts and the spirit? Well, well let me say that um, one good thing about theatricha is it's centered around the arts. Everything we do is around the arts, but the arts is not a restrictive thing. People think, oh, you're going to do art. That's nice, very sweet. We'll move on to other things. It actually is important for people to feel, as Kasas and Ramit are saying, their own spiritual power, their connection to spirit, their connection to the, the energies they need to help heal, to help change. I mean, because we all need help, and it's not going to happen just, just because you're out there. I need help, you know. But part of the help has got to be uh, being able to tap into those healing powers that I think everybody has. The arts has proven to be one of the most powerful ways to do that. I think spiritual and artistic practices give you the key to be able to tap into that um, those those uh, energies. And so that's why arts is important for us. It isn't just a nice thing to do, though it is nice. We have books at the Achucha, people can read. We have literature, we have performances, we have uh, workshops in music, and we have danza, we have all this uh, indigenous cosmology, Mishikayo, we have all this great stuff going on, I can't even name all of it. Uh, and it's all amazing, the community gets it, but it's also this aspect that uh, human beings, uh, the, to, to be really connected as humans, you have to tap into their spiritual um, being. And that's why it's being. It's not just where human people say, well, they're humans. Yeah, but they're human beings. And everything that has being, whether it's a tree, whether it's a dog, whatever it might be, has a spiritual thing. And the arts for human beings happens to be, if not the, one of the most powerful ways to really connect to that. 
And I always tell people, listen, man, especially if you've been more highly traumatized than others, there's a lot of pain in our community. A lot of it is that, as, as the other guys are saying, are systemic. These are not just pains of family or it's systemic. It goes back to generations. For indigenous people, it goes back to the, you know, when the colonialists and the invaders came uh, more than 500 years ago and the doctrine of discovery they brought in and, and pretty soon they're killing people, destroying them, taking away from their culture, putting them in boarding schools, to try and destroy their, their, their spirit as well as who they are. And yet here we are, all indigenous people trying to rise up again. And the way to do it is to tap into that part of you that they can't destroy, the spirit. So I, I just leave it at that. Every type of, um, if, you, as if we study history and any type of colonialism or tyranny, one of the first objectives is to break the spirit. And the thing about uh, uh, prison is that's what it's designed for, to go in and break the spirit. So when we get out, you know, of trauma or get out of prison because you don't have to go into the prison industrial complex to be subjected to prison or trauma. Uh, let's get that clear. And then secondly, though, when we're in there, we're so restricted mentally. We're so restricted emotionally that the, 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 the beauty of art and tradition opens us up, opens us up in a way that we're able to deal you know, with the trauma and we're able to better see what it is that we're going through, you know, and, and possibly bring about the healing necessary. But in the society that we live today, the objective is to destroy art, is to destroy uh, uh, healing, independent healing, and to destroy culture and tradition. They've been doing it from the time that uh, uh, colonizers entered this land and it's a continuous process because it's the means by which our suppression is uh, made real. You know, because as long as we're disconnected from tradition, we're disconnected from the earth. So long as we're disconnected from the earth and nature, then we're disconnected from spirit. And they understand this and they keep that from us. So the importance of trauma to to transformation is to reintroduce that back into the communities and uh, back to the people that need it most. Yeah, yeah you know, and I, and I, and I like what Chris is saying about the disconnect, you know, because at least from my own experiences, you know, I was disconnected for a long time, you know, um, and for me, the gang world, the gang life was, was my only connection to who I felt like I was. That's who I am. That's who I'm going to be a part of. That's my, that's 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 my whole life and I was gonna die for it, regardless of whether it was happening and um regardless I had kids at the time, they weren't as supporting my family, my community, like nobody no, nobody nothing mattered to me except the gang life, the gang world. You know, and and unfortunately it took a prison for me to finally realize that I do have a connection to something more spiritual, something more meaningful, you know, uh and, and it took my family it took my community it took people to write me letters to help me understand it because the prison wasn't going to do it for me mm -hmm. i had to do it within my own self i had to figure it out how to how, how to handle those kinds of traumas in in, in, the, uh, in a way that will keep me you know alive when i do get out you know um i ended up doing 13 and a half years and i did not know what was going to happen i didn't know I, it was it was it was scary to know that I'm gonna have to get out eventually one day and and, and be almost, you know be reborn again, renewed because I cannot keep going down that path. And and those connections that I made with with made more with my family that I didn't have before I went to prison really helped me understand that my life is not just my own, but theirs too. You know, they're a part of my life. And it was attributed to the poetry. I, I I'm a poet myself, writing poetry. But it's also attributed to learning about who I am as an indigenous person from these lands, from Mexico, you know, and uh, and that was important. And that's why I really feel like the common transformation is so important because that's what it gives to to all these people that are coming in and out, and or or like like the Sasi said, people that are in prison just within themselves, even if they're not part of the prison industrial system, that that they're you know the way the colonize the colonizers uh, create 
these prisons is making us feel like we're also a prison in our own selves. You know, so these these things are so important, and we really want to give to people and show them that how important uh, uh, the arts is, uh, learning who you are as an indigenous person, uh, learning about you know their connections to this world, and you know, uh, though, like I said, those are the things that I don't think if I didn't have that today I wouldn't be here right now. I've been out of prison for ten years now, and my life has not been any easier. It's not the answer to everything, all of these things we we're talking about. But yet, they, they, they are tools that will help me to know that um, I can survive it. The struggle at just being a, 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 a Latino, a Mexican, a Chica, Chicano, whatever you want to call me, is a struggle in itself. As soon as I was born, they already, the, the, the colonizers, the the bourgeois, whatever you want to call them, the this, this system already had a plan for me and, and it was not to be right here talking to all of them. That was not their plan. The plan was to either have me be six feet under or to keep me in prison. That was their plan as soon as I was born. That's how that's always been for over 500 years. They do not want us to be here uh, talking like this. They do not want us to be here expressing ourselves. They want us to be mindless robots serving them as slaves in whatever capacity. So to just break free from that, just to be able to do this is something very important. And trauma transformation gives that. And that's why I said I, I appreciate everybody who's a part of it because we all have our own struggles and and we can show people and, and share with them that we can get out of this. You know, we don't have to be stuck. But there is a possibility to get out of the situations that we're in. You know, and like I said, it's not going to be easy. And it doesn't mean your life's going to be super grand, but I could wake up every morning with a smile, knowing that I'm I'm free, that I'm okay, you know, that my you know that like that I could walk down the path. I don't have to keep looking over my shoulder, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Do you all? I I hear some um some messages about social justice. Um. So I and I and also heard uh, Louis, you were talking about your mentor who um, inspired you and was part of the movement. So I was wondering what y'all feel about why is this project important? Um, I know that um, Arts for Justice Fund was uh, helped with uh, starting it as a project at the Achuchas. And um, for those of you who don't know, the Arts for Justice Fund is a national movement of organizers, activists, artists who are coming together in different ways to advocate for uh, the end of mass incarceration um, and, and to do it in different ways, like uh, through the policy, through um, through like programs, through um, amplifying the, the voices of folks who are were directly impacted by the incarceration system so that our community can be awakened in a way or like be on the lines to making the movement grow to bringing the end to that. Um, so I was wondering what y'all feel about this work, this project, and the world that we're living in right now. Um, like what y'all mentioned uh, about colonization, uh, but also there's a you know how uh, there's been an ongoing movement of um, of you know Black Lives Matter started uh, a while ago, and it's just like a you know a continuation this year. Uh, of uh, more like in people's um, vocabulary now in the national scale. So like, I was just wondering what y'all think about the movements today and the movements um, of the past to build up to today's movements um, and then relations to um, the prison the, and the incarceration. Like what do y'all feel about uh, this work? Well, let me just start by saying that um, there's a saying that goes, uh, 20 years uh, go by that don't make a day. And then a day comes by that makes up for 20 years. Mm -hmm. In many ways, what I saw with George Floyd's murder uh, was a lot of coming together of a lot of energies that have been fighting the injustices and the police murders of blacks and brown people and poor people in general uh, for decades, decades. For, you know, it's been going on a long time. I came out of Watts. Um, that was my first community in 65 during the, the Watts Rebellion, uh, I wasn't living in Watts anymore, but I saw my neighborhood burning and I knew why. 
And I was very much like, I know exactly what's going on. I know why the people are pissed off because watch like a lot of these communities, like Pacoima, like all these communities has been constantly under control by the police, by the, the, the school systems, by all kinds of systems. And, um, and this is partly what brought me into a revolutionary mindset very young, which is good. It was good for me. Um, it, it, the thing about it is that it, I felt that the George Floyd protests and all that wasn't coming together. It wasn't like this new to us, but a lot of energy came together and I thought it was great. First of all, you're doing it under a pandemic and you got this crazy government that did not know how to handle the pandemic, didn't they messed it up, called chaos. I think p the politics of chaos is what they wanted to do and that's what they got. Chaos for them is good because it keeps us all on our toes. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what's up. But I, I saw this um, coming together of energies and poetry. And people say, well, it's rioting. You know what? It mostly wasn't rioting. It was very disciplined. I saw young people out there disciplined. I mean, people are looking at the burnings and the fires, and that's fine. They want to look at that. That's all fine. Uh, uh, some of those burnings, by the way, were by police themselves, infiltrators. Two, some people are just like instigators, just like to cause problems. And three, righteous rage. You know what I'm saying? People are just righteously right. pissed off. So it isn't, to me, it's not really the main thing. But what I did see was people doing bringing poetry. I was, I was watching this one protest in New York City with this young woman, a young black woman, got up and started reading this amazing poetry in the middle of this protest. It was amazing. It was disciplined. It was skillful. It was full of ideas. And that's what I saw more. You know what I mean? So to me, that's what I felt. All that was a coming together of many, many years. And I'm older than all of you, so you all know. I've been around a long time, and I've been at this a long time. And we've seen people come and go. But it was really beautiful to see that. I get it. There's a backlash. I get it that people are trying to clamp down on it. Um, I don't know if you all know, but when they try to stop the education of, of racial systemic injustices in the federal government, they wanted the words like systemic taken out and white privilege taken out and all these things that we're talking about. It's like, well, okay, that's exactly what they want us not to talk about, the things that we're right. actually saying this is what it is. So to me, it's, it's about getting more stronger, getting more organized, getting more out there. But I also feel it's important. I'm not talking about righteous rage. People have to be, you know, they're out there. I do feel we need more discipline, more uh, organized systemic vision about where we're going. What are we going to replace everything with? You know what I'm saying? Uh, if we have a, a dream, what is that dream? All these things. I'm interested in those things. And that's where the poetry and the art comes in. Well, I'd like to, you know, point out that um, the importance of replacing uh, um, punishment with penance. Because a lot of times we see the word penitentiary and prison and we don't realize that those were two different things because they had two different philosophies, two different principles. When you think of penitentiary, you think of the word penance, and this is the power of spoken word, is the concept of penance. Now, when you think of prison, you think punishment, right? So um, when we talk about uh, replacing pen, um, punishment with penance, we have to get back to rehabilitation because that's the root of it. Is rehabilitation or a healing. I don't even like rehabilitation because that 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 word right there means to re redress. But for us, you know, to get back to uh, putting healing into the uh, prison industrial complex is what the system itself is against. And in order to understand that, we have to go back to the history of it. One, uh, the prison industrial complex is based on the constitute part of the constitution that says that slavery shall be abolished except for one who commits a crime. So now we know that prison is the replacement of the plantation. Then when you look at patrols and officers, officers came from patrolling, the slave patrols. So when you see slave patrol and you look at the old slave patrol badge, it's the exact same style of badge that we see today. So when we look at the origin of prisons, we know that the origin of prison was uh, established for the sake of oppression and suppression and, and of a particular people. And then when you look at the law and the police, 
you know, slave patrols, their objective was to hunt a particular people. And this is why we see the culture of that even in this day, that they come out and they hunt a particular people because that's inbred and in the whole reason for their establishment. And the reason why we continue this or it's perpetual is because we don't go back and talk about those things. We don't go back and address those things, you know. So uh, prison, of course, was the replacement of the plantation and the inmate was the replacement of the slave. And the slave patrol is the replacement of the patrol officer. So this is all a reality. This is not a philosophy. This is not, uh, this is reality. And the problem with that is most people in prison are the people that's most aware of this. Now, the, and that's why they have to keep us in there. And the second part is um, the power of the spoken word. Louise talked about the poetry in this time. And you got to think back in the day before there was television and radios, what was the universal tool that was used for propaganda? Because there was always politics. There was always, you know, views that needed to be expressed. But the propaganda or the tool for propaganda was poetry. People would stand out on the street corners and blaze with poetry, whether it was for or against the tyrant, whether it was for or against the people. But it was the spoken word that was the actual uh, uh, weapon that was used to bring about change and that was used to establish uh, um, camaraderie amongst the people because the poet was the voice of the people. They understood that. Those that are in power understand this. This is why they took over the rap music and they started industrializing rap music and started pumping out all of this garbage, you know, because they understood that the power of the spoken word could actually move the people. So trauma to transformation is not only a necessary um, a movement for individual healing, but it's an actual movement that's necessary for the, hu the healing of our community and the healing of our society, especially in this time. This is the time where the poet can't be silent. This is the time where the artist can't be silent. This is the time that we have to be our most boisterous, you know, uh, and, and uh, most active in our, um, in our endeavors. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, there's a lot of great points that uh, my dad and Kasasi are uh, talking about because, uh, you know, and all of these movements that happen, you know, that they've been happening, but at least for this year, um, I'm, I'm hoping and I'm praying that um, it could be a catalyst of something even bigger. And it's important and we need it, you know. Um, yeah, well, that's great. You know, we got a new president, but it doesn't mean our struggle is going to be ended. We know that this stuff continues to keep going on, especially for us. So we need to keep putting, you know, we need to keep doing things that that will will, will help, you know, our young people, will help uh, you know, the next generation, the seven generations that are coming. You know, we need to we need to put you know um, uh, different things in place that will that will help with our survival. You know, uh, these movimientos, Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter and, and all these other movements that were that were coming, you know, that were that were created or formed, you know, have been so important, you know, for our generations, you know. Um, but I think it has to be bigger. It really does. I mean, we see, we saw what happened with the Occupy movement. You know how they were able to break that down, and it was great. And that was a window for us to even do something bigger. But of course, there was all these other things, logistics and policies and politics and all these things that got in the way. And and that's how they you know that's how you know divide and conquer that's how that's what they do that's what they do to us to make sure they try to divide us you know um and, and I'm really hoping that you know we you know we don't allow that to happen you know uh, I really support the Black Lives Matter movement I really do uh look as a Latino I, we struggle too I understand it we got deaths too you know and police have been killing us for generations we know that too. But at the same time, you know, you know, black people are dying, especially black men. They're dying. You know what I'm saying? And that has to be acknowledged. That has to be shown. I have to show people, look, man, you know, being black in this world is hard. You know what I'm saying? I mean, look, uh, growing up, 
you know, and, and, and living in South Central at the time, and it was hard for me being on, the only Latino in school, and I was getting beat up by black people. I was getting into fights all the time. So, you know, but then when I moved to Chicago and living in the Puerto Rican neighborhood, and I seen the, the you know, how we all came together in, in a different way, it really helped show me that, uh, that, um, that black people are not my enemy, that black people are just like us, that we're in the same struggle, we're going through the same thing that, that everyone else is going through. And, you know, and then in Chicago, uh, what we had to deal with was a lot of these white racist gangs. You know what I'm saying? And so that was pretty much just like what a white racist government that we have. You know, we're dealing with it in the street. We had all these, you know what I'm saying? So we had to come together for that. And that's what has to happen now, too. You know, and I think we need to support all these movements and all these things. That, that, that are going to keep us together. You know, the struggle is, is our commonality. The struggle is what we keep us showing that, you know, we're not any different, you know? Uh, no matter what the skin color is, no matter, you know, what neighborhood you come from, no matter your gender, whatever it is, a struggle is what was, was keeps us together and, and we need to know that we can fight together to survive it. Right. You know, because this government, this system is, does not want us to do this. And we know this. We've known this for years. We know this since, you know what I'm saying? And because we know this, then we have to start, you know, um, 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 organizing. We need to start mobilizing. We need to start, yeah. you know, being better with each other. We need to start, you know, start, stop trying to bring each other down. Stop, you know, because that's what they're going to want. You know, and, and, and that's what I, and, and it goes back to the trauma the transformation and this whole program that we create. Look, there are a lot of art programs. We know that. There are a lot of art programs, and, and, and I appreciate right. all of them. They go into the prison system and they do all of these great things. That's great. But what, what I feel like what we have is, is this indigenous component, is the spiritual component that we bring into the, the arts, that it's not just about learning how to draw a painting, that it's not just really about how to write a, write a poem. You know, it's about uh, us um, really uh, uh, tapping into these energies that can change the world. You know what I'm saying? And we know it's possible. We've seen it happen. We're not just talking about it and hoping that it's a reality. We know that these realities can come, can 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 manifest because we've done it. We've done it. We got three examples of men right here who have been through the dirt. <laughs> And have survived it, you know, because of those the, the poetry, because of those um, uh, um, indigenous um, teachings and that spiritual you know, and tapping into our spiritual healing. You know, we wouldn't have. I don't think we would. All three of us wouldn't be here right now if we didn't. If we didn't have that. So we know it's possible. We know it can happen. We just got to do it together. All right. Hey, I wanted to add, you said about in Chicago, you guys had to deal with um, white racist gangs. In L.A., our white racist gangs was called the LAPD. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I wanted to also highlight um, that there's been people doing abolition work for many years, and there are study guides out there to learn about the work that they've been doing that's very much what i hear from what you all are saying like um even the let's say um you know the work coming out of critical resistance um there's people out there like with the gilmore she all we, we can listen to her speeches and her uh and read her her work and podcasts and everything Miriam kava and and you know uh, angela davis of course there's a lot of people out there that are doing the everyday work um, to live a world without prisons. And what does that mean? Like, um, let's say um, it's not just like the police and the the prison system, but within our own, like, let's say um, the school settings, um, the world, a whole world around us is uh, a way to uh, part of the prison industrial complex, like working with probation. And um, so, so like a lot of work from like uh, queer organizers, uh, black and indigenous people, um, people are already doing that work of what does it mean to actually work, live uh, in a collective 
um, self, uh, what's it called? Self-determined way. Um, and I think that's, the, I think like Ramiro, you talked about like how even our everyday like ways that we treat each other, that's even comes down to that. And like, and undoing what, let's say the, the, the cop that might be inside of you, uh, inside each other, the racism that people carry um, to call the police on their neighbor right away. Um, that's some things like part of it too that I feel like is important is the consciousness raising of the, the community to undo those kind of thinkings that we've been conditioned to do because of our like colonization, um, because of the media, um, because the school system doesn't teach us our true history, doesn't teach us about like what Kasasi was saying about the, the, the roots of the police system. Um, so I think that's important to highlight uh, for folks um, who might be listening to look into the work of the, the people that have been doing this for many years already um, and been putting into practice and not everything's going to be perfect, but it's important to try. And that's what, 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 I uh, feel is important to move forward when it comes to ending the, the prison industrial complex. Right. Um, yeah. So, so let me just say that I think that um, it's important to look at this house that we call the system. It's falling down. It's a mm. house of cards, you know, but it's coming down. The issue for us, for me, I feel as revolutionary critical thinkers and activists is um do we help it just tear it down or do we begin to build a foundation for a new house? And I think that's a big issue for all of us. I think it's time that we think about a new house and what it's going to look like and what it, and how we can build that because I don't want to walk around in ruins. You know, capitalism is, is really in bad shape. There's nowhere around in the whole world is falling apart, but it's also very sturdy at a certain point, but the foundation, the root of it is going, you know what I'm saying? So the reason why we go to ancestral knowledge is because it precedes capitalism and there's a lot of wisdom in that. It goes from Africa to all the places in Asia to the Americas, what they call the Americas. Uh, even in Europe, there was indigenous thinking, indigenous minds that we want to tap into. It precedes capitalism. But we also need to have a vision that goes beyond capitalism. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So that capitalism becomes not the parameter we work with. I hope I'm making sense. We stay within capitalism, we're not going to get very far because capitalism cannot feed everybody, cannot abolish poverty, cannot abolish prisons. It can't. It can only deal with aspects of it. There's things that capitalism can do, but it's never going to deal with the fullness of it. So, so my thing is, <clears throat> what's the vision and the future that we're also carrying so that we can build a new house that's really strong, solid, and does have those no more prisons, no more poverty, you know what I'm saying? No more want, uh, where everybody uh, could be who they really are, uh, queer and otherwise. Everybody just be who they are. The world that embraces, you know, our intrinsic being. That to me is what we have to envision. So to me, that's where we're at, which I really find exciting because you know, this is hard to talk about these things. In previous times, we think you were kind of weird and nuts, but it's almost like the weird people are getting to become the normal. In that sense, you know, now now where people are talking stuff, we're all but some of us not. I don't want to say me, but necessarily, but a lot of us have been talking for a long time, and um, now others are saying the same thing. But I'm always trying to be one step ahead of everybody, only because I think we could push it further. You know what I mean? And uh, that's where I'm at. Where is our vision? How strong can that vision be? Where do we draw our resources and resources? Where's our sourcing coming from? Which I think is ancestral and indigenous and old, but still per pertinent today. I just wanted to mention, these ideas of the ancestral are not old, archaic ideas. You know, people want to talk about indigenous people as if we're just been old and tired and dead. And, you know, they're so pertinent now than ever before. As Kasasi says, the disconnections are very much what we're saying we need to connect to with nature, our own nature, with the nature of our relationships, and with the divine. One, one way or the other, we got to figure out how to connect again properly to these things. Yeah. I like how you said, you know, do we tear down the house or do we, you know, help tear it down or do we build up a new one? Uh, one, let's look at the house. And if we really look at the house and, um, and how it was established, one, 
when we look at capitalism, capitalism is an exclusive idea. It was never meant to include us, indigenous people, at all. You know, it was always inclusive to uh, those people that were in power. It's kind of like the Constitution of the United States. When they say we the people, they weren't talking about indigenous and uh, and slaves. They, they, you know, that's that that's automatically goes and women. Because women, you know, didn't have a right to vote and have a right to own property. All of this up until the early, you know, to 19, what, 50s, when they gained this right, 60s. So we're talking about, you know, a suppressive idea that was established in order to rule over. So capitalism itself, to capitalize, means to put a cap on, to suppress. The big, and if you look at it in uh, words, it's the one big alphabet while the, all the other ones are lowercase. So the objective is to suppress when you start talking about capitalism. And that's an idea that was alien to our nature because as indigenous people, we are an inclusive people. We think tribal, we think community, we think family. See, those were the wealths and the, uh, that, that we held dear to, not gold, you know, gold was something secondary. You know, gold was something that we adorned ourselves with. But the value of life was what we found. I think you went on mute. Understood this. Mm -hmm. They understood this. So they did everything that they could systematically to separate us from that. So in order for us to bring about the necessary change, I think that we have to reconnect to those things that they separated us from. And we have to understand the same people that educated us or indoctrinated us are the same people that oppressed and suppressed us. These boarding schools and all of the stuff that they forced us to go to uh, and they put our children through to this day. You gotta think they have our children from the time they're five years old to 17 to be fully indoctrinated at a minimum of six hours a day, you know, for years now, and then we wonder why the youth are confused and in contention to the wisdom and knowledge that their elders are giving them versus the indoctrination that the industrial school or the industrial complex is given. And I, I, I put the schools with the prisons because when you look in urban, urban schools, they got metal detectors and barbed wire and all of this stuff on the fence, you know? So the school itself has an institutionalized feel and me coming out of prison, I have a right to be able to identify that. But a lot of people don't. So even from the time that our children are young, they're conditioned for institutionalization. They're, they're indoctrinated with the knowledge that's alien to them and exclusive to them. And then on top of that, you know, after you do all of that indoctrinating and in, in uh, uh, preparing them for the schools, then you put a prison out there, you know, to, to incarcerate us and disenfranchise us. And it's all systemic and it's all uh, uh, diabolical. So we got to get back to that, re-educating our children, giving them to the, the traditions that were taken away from us. But first, we have to go back and reclaim those traditions. And the best way to do that is to pick up people who are open to that change because of trauma. You know, trauma will leave you open to whatever healing that there is available. So while the people are open, we have to seize that opportunity to be able to enlighten and and, catch and, and educate those kids. Mm -hmm. what, I do, and what I do like about from trauma to transformation, that um, it allows us to have these conversations. Mm -hmm. know, we're not, we're not just, we're not just trying to just have an art program or an indigenous healing circle. No, we're talking about change. And this was created, you know, I, don't know. I, mean, I mean, my dad was pretty much the one that created it, but it's from his experiences and the people in his own life that mentored him to be here, that allowed him to help create this. And then he knew the people to bring in, that this is his community. This is, you know, this is um, for, I mean, I, it would be great. I mean, and I think his connections have made it bigger, at least internationally, but it is the Northeast San Fernando Valley uh, uh program, you know, because that's what the Chutas concentrates itself, you know, but it is international. It's something that can become bigger and, and that's and I think that's the idea. You know, we want trauma to transformation to help with um abolishing all of these institutions and systems that have, you know, 
have created these traumas in our lives, you know, and I think that is so important for all of it. And we have to continue to keep looking at the history. And that was mentioned by my dad and Kasasi. Our history shows us that we, we, weren't, we didn't conform. We didn't. We had, you know, revolutionary leaders, you know, from, from slavery, Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman, from the native, I mean, the indigenous communities, you know, like Crazy Horse, Geronimo, Patemo, you know what I'm saying? Like, we didn't, you know what I'm saying? There was no conformity. We kept, you know, for over 500 years, we've still been at this war and we haven't stopped. And we're going to keep going. And these conversations need to keep happening. We need to create these plans. And it's great to defund the police, but then what are you going to do? Look, there's going to be a lot of police officers. They're not going to, they're going to be out without jobs. How are we going to help them? You know, I mean, we should, I'm not saying hey, defunding the police, we should do it. But then what? Now they're going to be the next homeless people. They're going to be out there without with their families and we can't feed them. You know what I'm saying? So these are the conversations. We have. How are we going to create a society, a world where everybody can be a part of it? You know what I'm saying? That we can all have a good, you know, a, a good, meaningful way of living with food and, 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 and imagination and poetry and all of the things that we need and you know, arts and, and housing and all these things that, that are so important in our lives that everybody can be a part of. You know, and those are, and, and, and I'm I'm really glad that the trauma transformation can help with those conversations. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There are a lot of people doing that work already. So maybe we can get into that later in another podcast. But I was gonna ask you all any kind of memories you have, um, like I guess now turning back to the actual programming yeah. and teaching part um anything that you feel like stuck out to you when y'all when you all are doing this work as teachers and mentors for one thing people should know that uh trauma transformation is in um is in two prisons uh lancaster through me even though it's not officially trauma transformation i am the person that helped bring that concept to Lancaster Prison, State Prison. And then we have our Roots and Wings at the California Institution for Women in Chino, which is important. We've been in the the, the Nidarf Juvenile Hall, which is the largest juvenile lockup in the whole North America, if not the world. Uh, we've been in there, we've been in parole housing, we've been in probation camps. In other words, just so people know that we're in these institutions, since the pandemic, we have not been able to go back but we're still interacting with them in some form or fashion. So I just think that's important for people to know. For me, at being uh, doing these workshops, I've been in Lancaster for about 13 years. Uh, I had a hiatus there for a while, and I came back in 2016. So I've been consistently in 2016. I would just say that one of the things that I find to be important is that the men that come to my classes, and I'm in both um, uh, uh, level four, which is the highest level of security, as well, a yard, as well as a level three. So, you know, it's less security, but still they're high security places. Um, <clears throat> I find that the men are hungry. I find that they're also open. I find that they also want to uh, connect with community in a proper, healthy way. I do, I get that they get a lot of unhealthy connections, but I find that they're really open to know how this can work properly and I think that's what I bring at least in my classes I do with the respect level is very high and I will tell you just one story uh as you know they always talk about black and brown in prisons hating each other it's not as bad as people say it is I get it there's gang politics that plays into it but I find that in general people get along the most California prison system is around 80 percent black and brown and so they have to find a way to interact with each other. You know, uh, they got to. But anyway, what I found is that when I first came back to the Lancaster prison, it was only black guys coming because um, the Chicano guys were not programming. You know, it was like a weird thing, but that's like they weren't programming. I knew exactly what, why. Mm-hmm. But what happened is they would go to the yard and tell everybody, this is great class. You know, mm-hmm. the black guys that were coming from my class, they'd go in there, man, this is great. So then some of the, Chicano guys heavily involved with the gang politics started showing up and they started watching me. You know, they didn't even say that much. They didn't even participate. I knew what was happening, but pretty soon they, they started coming regular. And now I got half my classes black and half are brown. And, you know, they get along completely. They respect each other. Nobody gets in the b- b- fights. And I'll tell you the one example was there was a guy that had spent six years in the shoe, which is the segregated housing unit at Pelican Bay. Mm-hmm. The shoes and 
of the prisons. Pelican Pay is the most notorious known. And he said, listen, man, and you know, he'd been around, you know, he'd been, but he changed his life. He said, listen, I wanted to commit suicide there. And I wrote a poem about it. And I don't mind talking about it because you can't talk about suicide in prison. That's very hard to do. He says, I don't mind talking about it because I don't feel that way no more. And I want to share this poem. It was a beautiful poem. Everybody was real quiet. And so we're all sitting around. They finished the poem. Everybody's clapping. And, and we start talking. All of a sudden, one of the Chicano guys gets up. And he had been in prison 34 years. And he gets up and he walks over to the black guy. And so we don't know what's up. Cause you don't know what's going to happen. You never know. Everybody got quiet. He goes up to him and then he hugs him. And he goes, I know exactly what you were talking about, brother. Cause he did 26 years in the shoe, 26 years in segregated housing. It was a beautiful moment. You know what I'm saying? Those moments that you can't plan for, you can't make happen. They happen when you create the conditions for people to know that we're in the same common space. And we have a common language now. And we have common experiences we can draw from. And it doesn't take away all the differences. All it does is says, says that with all the differences there, we're united in our common struggle and our common need to be whole. And I just want to mention how powerful that was. Right. Man, if I can add, you know, you said about the suicide and why it's hard for inmates to talk about that. You know, me being a former lifer, um, I understand. And the reason why it's hard to talk, one of the reasons why it's hard to talk about it, I believe, is because we were all on the verge of it. You see, we were all teetering on that edge, whether someone could pull us away from it or coach us to leap. You know, so a lot of us don't want to talk about it because we don't know, you know, whether or not we're going to be the cause of push or pull or whether or not that person's compensation will be the cause of our very own push or pull. So that's just one thing that I, I was thinking about when you were talking about that. And uh, the other is the thing that stood out for me is because I've worked with the youth and uh, going with the youth uh, for trauma to transformation inside Sumer Juvenile Hall and, um, and uh, Kirby, Dorothy Kirby. And uh, we've been in different like uh, high schools and, uh, continuations within the high and within the high school and like me and Lou uh, uh, Romero we go into halfway houses you know federal and state halfway houses where guys are making a transition from doing life sentences trying to reestablish themselves in society so the the difference between the two is for the youth they are blazing with poetry and the need to speak Whereas the adults, they don't have the poetry, but they have the need to be heard. And see, and both of them are in the same vein and, and they have the, it brings about the same healing, you know? So this is the importance of it. Like I, I've heard some beautiful poetry to come out of some of the most wounded people, you know? So for me, you know, just to be able to see that and to you know, hear these men and these young, uh, young, these youth get up and express their pains, and not only their pains. Oftentimes, they give solutions to whatever it is that has traumatized them, and they'll give the solutions in their own writing, often without even realizing that they've given the solution themselves, the solution to whatever problem that they've been going through. They've given that healing, so it's a twofold thing you know, with trauma to transformation. Um, we heal by giving other people the means of healing. So every time I go into those institutions, every time I go into those environments and I'm, and I'm teaching, I'm healing first before I'm uh, able to even provide any such uh, uh, opportunity. You're standing on my own to a success. After falling short, I'm right back. A tortured soul that wouldn't crack. I bled for it. I teared for it. I killed for it and served 27 years for it. But my Lord didn't bring me this far to blow it. There's something in me, man. I know it. I see it now despite the hood in me. I'm my mother's child, so there's good in me. A service to God and family with dignity as it should be. So like Los Angeles and them palm trees, tomorrow 
I will lift my head and be free. Oh yeah, um, and for me, um, I, I just I, I really appreciate Kasasi bringing me to help him um, because you know I, I got a chance to really interact with these these, these gentlemen um, that we've been helping from some of these halfway houses, you know, and, and that's been my experience with trauma transformation, um, being a Kasasi assistant, <laughs> you know, and and it's been great because I've learned a lot from Kasasi, but I also learned a lot from these gentlemen because you know this together you know i've been i was there on this on that side i was in a transitional house when i came out of prison you know and it, for me it was important um i couldn't just go straight home um after doing so many years in prison i don't think i was in the right mindset to do that so i needed a place that was going to help me and, and fortunately and fortunately in chicago i was able to find the probably the only one that they had called saint leonard and it really helped me they had programming there that was going to help me and i'm so i'm hoping that what we do with with our but from our, our program is that when we are allowed to get into these these halfway houses or, or the prisons or, in, or juveniles or wherever we go, that we can be the program that they look to, you know, because there are a lot of programs that are not there and they need them. And I'm glad that we have a programming that can help them. You know, I, I love the breakthroughs. I love that when we sometimes we talk with these gentlemen and they don't want to listen to us or they have their own views and things and they don't feel like we know what we're talking about or, Oh, you know, or they just, you know, they, especially when it comes to like religion and things like that, that we would bring in the spiritual part of it, you know, you know, they have issues with that. You know, that we can stay, stay consistent with it, you know, and, and then you see the breakthrough, you see the understanding. I'm not saying that they're, they're, they're going to, you know, follow our views and follow our ways of, of how we think, but at least they know that they can be, you know, accepted of, who we are, just like we're accepted of them, you know. Um, there was a conversation one time when, because what we do also, we, you know, we bring in the energy, we do also bring in feminine and masculine energy. We talk about that, how important it is, and how we have it inside of it. That's, but when it comes to religion, especially with men, sorry, they don't like it. They, they think that the feminine energy is not something that they have in their very um, machismo body, you know, and but that's how they grew up. I can't tell you know that's this is what was ingrained in them. They know they never learn any other way. This is and I and not just religion, but also from the street. The streets teach you that. The streets teach you that we're you know to be much easier that you can't get into your feminine energy, that you can't cry, that you, you know that's not manly enough. You know, that's what that's what it teaches us. You know, so we try to break that out too. And we try to tell them that we do have two kinds of energies inside of us and they're both very important, you know. And I love that. And the toughest guys, the ones that do things that can listen to that, finally do. And they, you know, they accept it. Maybe not completely, because <laughs> it takes a long time to really accept it. But at least, they, you know, it's something that they can think about. And those are the seeds. We're just we're planting seeds. And not just for them, but for like what we're talking about, for generations. They're going to be, you know, we're trying to, we're talking about leaders. We're, we're trying to teach these men to be on our side, on, on, on our end of it. You know, where we want them to be able to go into the places where they can come and teach their own poetry and their own art and their own, you know, and their own, you know, philosophies and things that are important to them to, you know, because that we need to keep doing it. And that has to happen for generations. And so, like I said, those are the seeds. Those are the seeds that we hope we can get to make you plant. Thank you. Okay. So we're getting to the end of the interview. Um, do you all have any last thoughts where we can wrap up? Well, the only thing is, um, please support the Achuchas, support the Tama Transformation Program. There is a, a link on our webpage uh, for, to, to donate. We need a lot of support. Uh, we do get good support. And I want to, again, say, shout out again to Arts for Justice Fund, who has given us a lot of money and support, and they're national, and they work with all these people doing the arts in incarcerated settings and parole housing and formerly incarcerated. So we want to give that shout out. Uh, and the only other thing to say is that, you know, it, if the lesson is true uh, that people can change and the societies can change, then I think that this, it, it forces us to look at the world differently. We don't have to be held in prisons, regardless of whether they're actual bars and razor wire, the prisons inside ourselves that society has put on us. We don't have to be in those prisons anymore. Yeah. 
Uh, yeah, and I, so I just want to say, you know, um, I, I, I just don't want us to forget one person that has been very helpful in all of this and making strong connections with all of these organizations. And if it wasn't for her, I don't think we would have gone as far as we've gone. And that's for Rebecca. And hey, Rebecca. Rebecca. For all of this. <laughs> yes. yes. You know, <laughs> because, I mean, and especially with me too, just trying to be a part of all of this. I have a lot of traumas. <laughs> And if Rebecca had good conversations with me and has helped me to try to handle my own things and the own the things that I have to deal with. And I really appreciate that, you know, and, and I know that she's impacted a lot of um, men and women and young people from this program. And I, and I want her to know that, how important her presence to be a part of this program is. You know, yeah, we've had the three experiences, of all, all three of us, you know, but, you know, she has, a, had her, she has her own experiences. She has her own voice. And I think that's important. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad that we were able to help her bring that out. Because I know there were <laughs> times she didn't want to say anything. I think we helped her get some confidence, you know, and I'm, really, uh, I'm glad that she has it because, like I said, it's important. And like I said, and this is the program. It helps all of us. This trauma to transformation, this is the program. And I'm hoping that people can see that and, and, and they can be a part of it and they can understand it. It's because you, know, you haven't got what we've gone through doesn't mean you can't be a part of this. this is, we're all going through trauma in some way or some, or, you know, and, and we need to be able to transform. And this is what trauma transformation does. It helps us. Great. I second everything that Romero said in regards to Rebecca, too. That's, uh, that's important. I'm glad he pointed that out. And just for, just for me and the last thing, you know, that I would like for people to, you know, to impress upon is that, the necessity for trauma to transformation, you know, even in the title trauma to translate transformation, we living in some traumatic times, you know, we just got rid of or, you know, still trying to get rid of a traumatic leader, you know, uh, living and ruling and, you know, uh, during a pandemic, you talk about healing. This is the time that healing is most necessary, healing from old wounds, healing from bad leadership, healing from a pandemic just healing, period, healing from our past and uh, our uh, suppression and oppressions or whatever wounds that we may have. This is a time, you know, for healing. So if you don't even understand what we do at Tia Chuchas in regards to trauma to transformation, please understand that we are healing. And not only are we in the, in the job of healing, but we're on the front lines doing it. We're in the trenches doing it. We're not, you know, uh, just doing it from a high arc platform. I mean, we're down there in the gutter, in the soil, you know, uh, doing the work. So if you have any reservations or anything in regards to whether or not you should help or support, understand that, that healing is in the process and it's being done, you know, by people in the trenches and not just uh, on media platforms. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, thank you for your words, all of you. Um, for me, I've, I don't, I can't even express how much gratitude I have working with you all and working at the Achuchas. I feel like I've, I've expanded personally, like my spirit, my, um, myself, my vision of my self worth and like my healing. I, um, I wouldn't be where uh, it, I can't even explain it. Um, yeah, but I, I just all thank you all so much for, for what you do and the heart you put into it. Um, I feel like um, a lot of people, a lot of our community and, and society in general might not um, know those feelings of the heart, working with the heart. And I, I feel like I learned a lot from you all of what that means, um, that feeling of working with the heart. Um, so I'm really honored to be part of this. Thank you. I, yeah, I learned a lot from all of you all. And um, thank you for your support and, and having this podcast too, to getting what the word out there. Um, I always, yeah, I always enjoy talking to you all. So um, thank you. Thank you, so thank you all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you again for joining us. Please remember to subscribe to our podcast and follow Tia Chuchas on social media. Please support our online bookstore. You can find the links in our podcast bio. Stay safe, stay creative. Tia Wee.